game. The lack of a real football man giving support to Fears led to his firing in 1970, and John Meekham then brought in a stern taskmaster named J.D. Roberts to undertake the first of many rebuilding programs. By the time I got to the Saints as a rookie in 1971, many of the players Tom Fears brought in to provide a solid base for the franchise were gone, and the team was already four years behind the rest of the league. By 1973, it was time for another change, and John North started his program with a new crop of rookies that had no way of knowing what a rocky road was up ahead. I don't think I would have been here if I could have seen into the future. The deep is tough on the field is just negotiating. In just over two years, things fell apart for North, and it was time for another coaching change. This time, Meekham brought in Hank Stram with hopes that Hank could lead the Saints to a Super Bowl, just as he did with the Chiefs. Stram used an arsenal of talent that included the likes of Chuck Muncie, Henry Childs, and Tony Galbraith, but his inability to please John Meekham and winning only seven games over his two-year stint forced another change, and Dick Nowen took over in 1978. I enjoyed my best seasons in the NFL under Dick Nolan as he brought in Wes Chandler, Ike Harris, and Conrad Dobler to give us one of the most explosive offenses in the league. We moved the ball and won seven games in 78 and had a 500 season in 79, but there was turmoil in the front office and the success was deceptive. During those years, I think we probably had better talent at skill positions than what they have now. We had, uh, we had Henry Childs, uh, Chuck Muncy, Tony Galvez, Archie was at the top of his game. Uh, we had Ike Harris, who was playing extremely well, and you had Conrad Dobler in there. He had the offensive line all stirred up. The problem with that is we never had, uh, we never had the defense to come along with it. No, our defense was horrible. Maybe no one noticed our shortcomings because many picked the Saints to win the NFC West in 1980, but those experts had no way of knowing what was to come. Changes in the front office and a hidden drug problem led to disaster. By season end, Chuck Muncy was traded, Dick Nolan was fired, and we finished the season 1-15. and Bum Phillips was brought in to run the entire operation, and he spent his first two seasons finding the players he wanted to mold into his type of hard-nosed, run-oriented team. I didn't fit into those plans, so off I went to Houston, and in walked Kenny Stabler, who along with Dave Wilson, took the team to the brink of the playoffs in the last game of 1983. It was then that Mike Lansford's game-ending field goal ripped the heart out of Bum's team and severely shook the confidence of Bum. The team was never the same. After some questionable trades and some heartbreaking losses in 84, John Meekham decided to sell the franchise to Tom Benson in 1985. Through it all, some blame John Meekham for the 20 years of misery. But you would be hard-pressed to find any former Saint players who would find fault in Meekham's efforts. Sometimes he did, but sometimes he didn't. He, he's a grown man. He bought this team, and uh, uh, I think he was wrong for not seeing it and listening to the wrong people. John had good intentions, but John listened to the wrong people. John Meekham really wanted to win. And just like you just said, he didn't know how to get the right people. He maybe might have a good coach, and he didn't have a good general manager. He'd have maybe a good general manager and couldn't get a good coach. I mean, he just couldn't put them all together. John Meekham did spend a lot of money on this franchise. We did everything first class except win. Now that things are settled, the players can concentrate on winning. Some feel that a lack of a winning attitude among the players over the first 20 years bred a losing feeling that hung over the franchise like a cloud. So I saw guys getting, we got beat 62 to 7 and they're wondering where we're going to go eat after the game. I tried to wait until the sun goes down so I could hide and sneak out of the locker room. I was embarrassed of getting beat that bad. Through it all, the fans kept coming to the stadium. And it's for them that we former players are feeling the most joy now that the team is winning. They got a little strut in their step. They're happy. Most of all, for the fans, they're really doing it for the fans. They've been waiting 21 years. I think they're reaping everything they did before. This has given this community something to talk about a positive light. Maybe it was a question of timing for us former Saints players. Maybe it was luck. For all touched by this organization, whether it be simply as a coach, player, front office, or even a fan, time has proven true the old adage, good things come to those who wait. 
the fondest uh, memory I have was winning, beating uh, Washington people like that in L.A. when we wasn't supposed to win. And the Baptist Club, I think they're excellent defense, special teams, and they're playing up to their capacity. No team wins without good players, and prior to Jim Morrow's arrival, the Saints had a few, but in the last two years, they've gotten a whole lot more. When you look at the composition of the 1987 Saints, the best team in the club's history, you find a foundation laid primarily by Bum Phillips, but that foundation went largely unimproved upon until the arrival of Jim Mora in 1986. Then, with two tremendously productive drafts, an infusion of free agents, a timely trade, and the addition of two key acquisitions Phillips had made in the USFL supplemental draft, the Saints suddenly gelled into the most surprising team in the NFL. While Bum's ill-advised trades often left the drafting cupboard bare, he scored big in selecting hard-hitting inside linebacker Vaughn Johnson and kick return specialist Mel Gray in the USFL supplemental selections. Jim Fink's only trade here was a shrewd one, netting last year's leading receiver Mike Jones for running back Wayne Wilson, who's no longer in football. Jim Moore's experience in the USFL led to the acquisition of former Philadelphia stars like Chuck Comiskey, Antonio Gibson, and Sam Mills, with Buford Jordan, another USFL product. Free agent Van Jakes was another find in 1986. But it's been the drafts of the last two years which have catapulted the Saints heavenward. Just look at the evidence. In their first draft, Finks, Moore, and player personnel director Bill Q. Herrick uncovered Jim Dombrowski, Dalton Hilliard, Reuben Mays, Pat Swilling, and Reggie Sutton. They've all made significant contributions. This past year's draft saw eight selections make the team. Sean Knight has had no impact to date, but should eventually. Many who followed him have. Mo Hill, Michael Adams, Steve Trapillo, Milton Mack, Gene Atkins, Toy Cook, and Robert Clark all made the roster. Most show indications of enjoying long careers. Some could be stars. No coach wins without good players. A keen eye for talent at large and in the draft has provided a bonanza of them. Now with players like these, the Saints are respected on the field, but unlike other years, they're also respected in the front office. Well, respect is a big part of the success of the Saints organization. Certainly the players respect Jim Mora, but Jim Finks has brought something to this front office that the Saints have never had, and that's credibility and respect from other teams, other organizations, other front office people throughout the league. Tom Benson's track record as a manager of people has always been to hire good people, leave them alone as long as they're doing their job, and that seems to be what he's doing with Jim. Jim Finks, who in the past, in other situations, has bridled a little bit when people have tried to pull in the reins on him. Well, we talked about luck earlier in the show. I think the Saints were very fortunate that Jim Finks was available when Tom Benson was searching for a general manager. And let's commend Tom Benson for hiring Jim Finks as his president and general manager. The whole atmosphere around this franchise has changed now. When John Meekham owned the team, it was sort of a hobby, and it was a lot of fun to be around the team, but there was never the business-like atmosphere that right now pervades the entire organization organization. Business-like approach the entire way. Certainly Tom Benson is a successful businessman. Jim Finks runs the front office like a business, as it should, and certainly we're very familiar with the way Jim Mora uh, runs his football team. Of course, they are the three main ingredients who have helped make the Saints what they are today, a winning football team. There's some other ingredients as well, and Frank Davis is going to start whipping those up right after this. Build a form. Uh, an operation uh, on rock and not sand and I think in the past it's been it was being built on sand instead of rock and now it's on rock and I think this is uh, the ultimate results since New Orleans is famous for its fine food it's only natural to compare the Saints winning season to a great recipe both result from properly mixing the best ingredients with that in mind we sent Frank Davis into the kitchen to whip up this special dish. You know, New Orleans has been trying to get this recipe for years, but for over two decades now, it looks like it's been one of the best kept secrets in the city. Oh, it's not that a lot of folks hadn't tried to prepare it, but for some reason or another, it never came out right. Well, here are the ingredients you need. One hard-boiled, unspoiled coach, 45 players that are boiling hot, 13 teams ripe for picking, 70,000 individual servants of well-seasoned fans. You need a Cajun brand quarterback, six to eight ball carriers with sticky fingers, four toughest meat front linemen, a sure-footed Danish kicker, one locally grown owner, and a handful of lucky breaks. Now, here's what you do to put it all together. 
First, start with a surface you can work with, something flat and green, about, about 100 yards long. 